And more specifically, I would like to uh, focus on migration foreign policy, which is, in my view, key for any sustainable migration policy fit for the challenges of the 21st century. And to quote uh, John F. Kennedy, uh, the purpose of foreign policy is not to provide an outlet for our own sentiment of hope or indignation. It is to shape real events in the real world. And in order to be able to shape uh, three elements are in my understanding essential. One, we need a clear vision, a clear goal of what we want to achieve, which international system we want to create. Two, we need a clear understanding of what the world looks today, but also the challenges and uh, the future ahead. And three, of course, the strategic use of available resources to achieve the goals that we have set. In other words, a proactive future forward-looking migration policy should be evidence-based, building on analysis, strategic foresight, and scenario building. Um, Tobias, very sorry to interrupt you, Tobias. I, I, I didn't know if you wanted to share slides. We can't see them currently if you did want to share slides. Otherwise, we could um, work with Lucas, who can, who can display your slides if you have some. Just uh, I wanted to make sure um, that that is working. No, I have not prepared any slides. Okay, that is totally fine. Sorry for interrupting. No worries. Um, as we have already heard today, Forecasting is an inherently difficult task and very much the art of the possible, in my understanding, for two reasons. Firstly, we are operating in a complex world of extreme uncertainty where a multitude of factors may cause or contribute to migration. This is a world we are living in fueled by global power conflict, international conflict-induced displacement, the possible disastrous impacts of a pandemic, as we have heard, an economic depression that might have a destabilizing impact for years and prosperous and poverty stricken societies alike, climate change, smuggling and human trafficking, and countless other challenges that may have a significant impact on global migration. Secondly, we're operating in a field where research is still developing and predictive methods and tools are evolving quickly, despite existing present methodological, statistical, technological or even legal limitations. We are therefore very grateful as co-organizers of this event today that so many distinguished experts joined us today to discuss the way forward and exchange best practices. Um, Richard Fontaine, the CEO of the Center for New American Security and former advisor to US uh, Senator John McCain recently said in a foreign affairs article, ultimately, the unpredictability of world events puts a priority on human judgment and undermines rigid formulas. That means, as was mentioned already a couple of times today, that predictive tools and methods may not be able to detect the black swan amidst all the white swans. It may not be able to predict singular migration events. However, in a world of uncertainty, it might contribute to a better understanding of present and future developments in global migration, thus reducing uncertainty and bringing more light to the complex phenomenon of global migration. This is the reason why also, of course, we in Austria are working on our own predictive models. And to name just one example, I want to highlight our current so-called METRAS research project where new methods for monitoring early recognition and trend analysis on migration flows are being developed. We are here considering a fusion of information from satellite images, open resource, but also social media data that we want to use to estimate to better predict developments in the geographical setting of Northern Africa. Unfortunately, I'm not yet in a position to present more concrete results today but they should be available by the end of the year and will then be evaluated. Um, starting from uh, these uh, initial observations, uh, I, I want to make two initial remarks. As, as Liz Collette said in the morning, exact predictions are impossible, which is in particular true when it comes to major disruptive events. But I still think the highlight shown today shows that forecasting foresight in scenario building efforts that are worth to be undertaken. And what I want to underline even more is that forecasting is not an end to itself. 
but it should be a basis for our actions, our future policy, a guideline on how our limited resources are best used to shape the world we live in. And this brings me to the second part of uh, my intervention today. How can we better link forecasting and foresight and scenario building with concrete migration policy? Ladies and gentlemen, um, just as forecasting, migration and asylum policy making is itself also the art of the possible. I've heard uh, some remarks on the pact uh, today and let's see what it really brings. But uh, the truth also is on a new level, we have for many years been struggling to create a better and fairer asylum and migration system. And uh, given the multitude of drivers of migration, uh, clearly a whole of government approach is needed uh, to have, uh, achieve improvement on the external dimension of migration. Uh, for today's purpose, however, I will restrict myself to the field of migration in a stricter sense. And I think what we need predictive analysis here for is answers, or answers might be asking too much, at least hints, and how and where we can react much more quickly to, pos to possible future crises and help people in need of protection as early as possible already in the region of origin. But also, of course, on the other hand, forecasting can contribute to combating irregular migration and breaking the business model of uh, smugglers who spread lies about uh, the information and destination countries and cause much suffering along the routes. Um, what we need is building scenarios based on sound migration forecasting tools. And this can be key to a more effective migration management, a more effective migration government. And this should help us guide our interventions and investment. If I may highlight this in the three fields, um, one example for me is the area of information campaigns. Predictive analysis, analytics may inform us where social media and online communication campaigns with potential migrants are most needed to protect people from false promises and um, misleading information they might have. Already today, countries like Austria and many other countries in Europe around the world are investing strongly in information campaigns. We do so in countries from Northern Africa over the Western Balkans to the Silk Road countries. We are focusing on issues like the prevention of illegal migration, but also alternatives that might exist in uh, the country they are present or possibilities for voluntary return. And not only we, but many member states and we are highly committed to putting an even bigger focus on using information campaigns and modern communication tools. But of course, we would want these campaigns to be even much more targeted geographically and on content. And I think this is where forecasting could be very useful and helpful. If you allow me one side note, it will also be very interesting for us in the future to have more knowledge on what social media platforms can do in terms of predictions and how research and governments could cooperate with them to make better migration predictions. A second field that I want to shed some light on is uh, the connection between migration forecasting and scenario building, which could have give, give us clues to pursue more targeted projects and capacity building endeavors in and with countries of origin and transit. And transit. Ideally, we could arrive at concrete recommendations on, what, on where to better direct our resources to create an environment where one possible scenario on future migration development that is more favorable becomes more likely than another scenario that is less favorable. It might show us where we need to help improve the economic and social situation and resilience of potential migrants in countries of origin and transit giving life to an effective whole of roots approach. Already today, many European countries, including Austria, are helping uh, third countries, for example, like Tunisia, in improving their border management systems, but also in creating economic perspectives as an alternative to irregular migration. We promote voluntary return activities on the Western Balkans, and we will become more active in providing protection in Eastern Africa. We are of the understanding that we are probably moving in the right direction. But as I said, we're living in a world of limited resources and predictive analytics could 
contribute to making our action even more effective in terms of reaching the goal of a really better and fair humane international asylum and migration system. In short, what we want to achieve and where we hope that forecasting can help us, um, we hope to move from a reactive migration management system to a proactive migration management system, making better use of all available resources. And last but not least, not only in the third countries, but of course also on an EU level, we want to be able to detect and predict mixed migration flows as early as possible. So forecasting can thus help national border forces and Frontex to, better, to be better prepared to protect our common external border, improve the reception capacities of member states, and increase their general preparedness for new challenges. I think, as you can see, um, the hopes we harbor in new predictive tools are very high, and we hope they can contribute to the creation of a better international asylum and migration system that takes into account the interests of all the stakeholders involved, the migrants and refugees themselves, the countries of first reception and transit, but of course also the interests and concerns of receiving societies uh, thus enjoying democratic legitimacy. To this end, we would like to support science in establishing functioning and effective predictive tools. We are very keen on knowing which models have the best or real predictive value, where can we invest more. I think a lot needs still to be done, and we trust that this cooperation between science and government uh, can contribute to making the complex nature of migration a bit less complex, opening the pathway for new and more targeted policies. In an ideal world, we could thus possibly even formulate proactive migration policy that provides the basis for actions even before crisis, threats, conflicts, and displacement at large scale on an international level even occur. Ladies and gentlemen, um, let us move forward in this positive spirit to reach these hopefully common goals I want to thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Tobias, for this um, intervention and for, for Austria's uh, position on this. It's uh, very interest, interesting to to hear. Um, uh, you, you mentioned several things that sort of stuck in stuck in my head. First, uh, of you also mentioned that. You acknowledge, and the Austrian government acknowledges that this research is evolving. It's sort of exploratory. Many countries are testing out different models. International organizations are testing out different models. And um, you also mentioned that there are high hopes for their um, ability to, in some sometime down the road, predict uh, migration more accurately. Uh, in this exploratory process, sort of do, is there an exchange at the technical level? Of course, this conference is part of this exchange, but also between the different teams in the different countries sort of developing these models on which which approaches work best? Um, that would be one question um, I would have as somebody that's sort of working in this area and interested in the exchange of, of best practices. Is this something that is um, being, being done also at the technical level? Um, well, uh, just as you said, um, the very purpose of this conference uh, which was co-organized by IOM and the Austrian Ministry of the Interior, was to gather as much expertise as possible, have an exchange on best practices, and find the best way forward. Um, and I, I think this conference proved very valuable on this one. Um, we are testing in different fields, different models, and we are cooperating. Um, as I said, um, the Mitras project that we are currently um, following is a joint venture between different ministries in Austria, but also private stakeholders. Um, I know um, I cannot um, speak for others, but like there are different branches within our ministry that all look in their respective field on how forecasting and foresight can be improved. Um, I, I listened very carefully to the intervention of IASO, and I know there is very good cooperation between our asylum department and IASO, and we are also part there of a pilot project if I'm not misinformed. So yes, of course, uh, in the respective fields, in their respective branches, there is cooperation going on. 
And I think my colleagues in the field of, uh, of frontiers and uh, illegal migration do the same with their respective colleagues. Um, we are also looking very much forward to um, uh, developments on the EU level. And um, um, so to a certain degree, we are also following up on, on the conference where we, I think, met one or two years ago under the Finnish presidency. So there is this exchange going on and it's growing. And um, yeah, that's about it for the moment. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, thank you, Tobias, for those clarifications. Um, I, I cannot help myself but to make one comment, which uh, you said, you, you know, the, the, the Austrian government is supporting science, and I just want to, uh, yeah, so second that and, 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 and speak on my appreciation for that position, because as we see in the news every day, not every government around the world is, is, is doing that these days. So, um, so thanks for that. With that, um, with that, we're moving uh, to our second speaker, um, Susanna from DG Home at the European Commission. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, DG is working on a feasibility study there, trying to pull in various data sources to, to, to test the viability of forecasting the EU. And um, yeah, I'm now excited to hand the floor to Susanna for her presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jasper. I hope that you can hear me well and you can also see my presentation. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you that you bear with us uh, for so long. And uh, I'm extremely happy to, to present the EU approach, especially that the previous speakers raised already a lot of expectations uh, concerning the content of the, of the pact that was uh, adopted last, uh, last uh, week. I'm absolutely fascinated by the level of the presentation and, uh, and the richness of the knowledge that, uh, that you transmitted today. And I'm also a bit intimidated because I, I see a very big responsibility for the Commission and for DG Home actually to channelize all of this knowledge into, into policy making and also into a system which could, which could work for, uh, for everybody, for, for all of the, the stakeholders. And that's why I'm very proud, actually, that the Commission also got so far that, that we can also bring some elements uh, into this uh, conversation and we can also present uh, maybe an added value uh, in this, since the Commission is always in the crossfire uh, in, the, in the migration development, and it's very difficult for, for the Commission to make all of the parties happy. So I hope that, uh, that my presentation will give some, some hope. Um, so, uh, so just to start, yes, um, last week the new Pact on Migration and Asylum was adopted with an extremely complex set of, of documents. There are a lot of legal initiatives and also there are initiatives which are non-legal nature. There is a very rich evidence paper, which I would like just to, to reflect to the previous uh, speakers, where they plead for evidence-based policy making. I think that is the paper, one of the first one, which, which uh, uh, summarizes in a complex manner also all of the statistics uh, in uh, what happened in the last year, the migration field, and the, what characterizes the migratory flows and uh, the stock of uh, migrants and refugees uh, in the EU, really with, with statistics and, and facts and, and figures. And there are also recommendations uh, in this pact also concerning migration forecasting and also, for example, the search and rescue operations. Um, we are also very happy actually that, uh, that all of the development and lessons learned of the, of the last years could really lead to, to concrete uh, commitments uh, into this uh, pact concerning all early warning and, and forecasting. And there are two pillars, basically, in all of these documents, uh, which uh, include the description of our endeavors. And one is the communication itself uh, about uh, the, new, the new pact, uh, which speaks about the, the improvement of effectiveness via preparation and foresight and the need of an evidence-based uh, approach. And the other one is the recommendation for a so-called migration preparedness and crisis blueprint, which is a self-standing document, and this is a commission recommendation. So basically, this is the commitment of the commission 
uh, how to set up and, and how to move, uh, how to set up uh, such tool and how to uh, strengthen the contingency and the preparedness of the EU institutions, the agencies and, and the member states with anticipation and also how to move forward if there is a crisis and how to uh, coordinate uh, uh, all of the all of the actors. So basically, these are the two documents which are which are relevant. But the most um, the more detailed rules are laid down in this migration preparedness and, and crisis uh, blueprint. Uh, it is very important to set out that. Uh, that the pact is the, the fruit basically of a long learning process. 2015, uh, the so-called uh, refugee crisis was also a wake-up call for, um, for the member states and also for the Commission and the EU agencies. And, and we learned a lot since then, and a lot of things ha have happened also in the field of preparedness in the field of uh, uh, information gathering and contingency building, and also uh, in the provision of uh, a rapid uh, response capacity that we could also see also in the last year. So basically the PACT already summarizes what we have built up and what we learned uh, in the, in the last, uh, last five years. To set up an EU-wide uh, early warning and forecasting system, it's very challenging. I, I have to be very sincere about it, and it's not a silver bullet, and it's not the absolute, the ultimate solution. Uh, because we are acting in a very complex institutional and political setup, that there are many actors also who are pursuing their own political objectives, their own financial uh, objectives as well. So we have to uh, we base uh, all of our systems among, uh, on the understanding how all of these uh, different stakeholders are operating. Now I'm talking about the member states, I'm talking about the external action service, uh, also about the different EU agencies and of course uh, the Commission, and we cannot uh, forget the third countries, the countries of origin and the countries of transit, which have their also own, own interests. And that's why not just um, a European migration policy, but also a such forecasting system. It is not a standalone uh, mechanism, but it is just one puzzle in the big picture, which has its own place, basically. And it has their own function in this entire complex uh, machinery, in principle. So that is one challenge, to, to work in this environment and, in principle, to uh, create a broad consensus how this system could work and what would be the result of this, uh, of this system uh, that it would deliver. So we have to very well define the targets, what we want to uh, forecast in principle, and what should be the, the output of this product. Um, for the moment, uh, we are thinking about um, of course, a multi-agency approach, because as uh, already Britta uh, told about the German experience, we completely share this sort of multi-agency approach that all of the different stakeholders that bring in their knowledge according to their respective competencies. And basically, we cannot create and operate any system in a void, just with the stakeholders. And that's why we have to be, uh, build on the member states' uh, experiences and also on all of the experiences of the agencies. Um, and I have to say that this sort of uh, cooperation already brought a lot of fruits uh, in, the, in, the, in, the last, uh, in the last years, also in terms of forecasting, because uh, the European Border and Coast Guard Agency and also EASO, they develop their own forecasting or early warning uh, methodology and early warning system. And basically, there was also uh, one occasion when we could test this system, and that was um, one year ago, the so-called caravan, caravan-like movements, which started to move uh, from Turkey into the EU and from, from Greece uh, towards the Western Balkans. And with this early warning system, 
provided by the two agencies and also Europol and all of their intelligence and how it was channelized into the political level, actually we could achieve with a great efficiency that these caravans didn't start. So that was, I think it, it was one of the best examples how this system was completely put uh, already into operation. For the moment, what we, are, what we would target uh, with an uh, early warning and forecasting system, that would be a short-term uh, forecasting. Let's say the next uh, one, three months, or six months. And we more, mostly concentrated on uh, irregular migration and within irregular migration to illegal border crossings at the EU external borders. It is also very important really to differentiate what kind of migration we are talking about. So for the EU from all operational perspective, this, it, it has uh, very, uh, the, most, uh, the most impact for the moment. And of course, we have to pay attention what is the action, what is the outcome of that, uh, that for, uh, early warning system and how it f would feed in into the work uh, of the decision makers in principle. Britta asked already in her presentation uh, how this system would operate uh, and how, this, uh, uh, um, how we could share all of this. So basically, uh, the blueprint that I mentioned, it sets up a network which is not just a network, so it's not 20 people sitting around the table and discussing, but it's in, in, in principle, this is an entire governance of the preparedness and also crisis management. And one part of this um, uh, preparedness is the monitoring and situational awareness and early warning and forecasting. So actually that you can see on the left, uh, on the left uh, side of this, uh, this presentation. And it would, it would work via a network from uh, nominated uh, contact points from all of the stakeholders and bringing in their own experiences uh, in principle also for situational awareness and then on that basis uh, for the um, early warning and forecasting system that would be established in the future. And uh, in the last, uh, on the bottom part of the slide, uh, with uh, red, uh, in the red square, you could see what would be actually the operational response uh, to that, what, what is the action. And basically this is financial support, uh, strengthening of the return, emergency support, uh, and constant exchange of information, for example, or also contingency uh, uh, planning and, and uh, contingency uh, increment in, um, in within the EU member states and also in, in third countries and the countries of, of transit. So basically what we would expect also from this information sharing and forecasting system, these are uh, concrete operational decisions, which would be actually then the response at the end of the, of the process, which would be the response in the, in the short term. Um, the basis of, of such system would be actually um, to have a common understanding about the situational picture in the EU. We are extremely lucky because we didn't start from zero. We actually started from the crisis mode and that was generated also by 2015 and the crisis. That uh, all of this information sharing and gathering into a complex situational awareness report it is started on a platform which is called IPCR platform and it's operated by the General Secretariat of the Council where the member states and the agencies and the commission, they are uh, uploading all of their information about the situational pictures and uh, the commission is obliged on the basis of that information actually to write uh, a report, a migration report with a weekly frequency. It is always due on, on Wednesday, so my team actually is working on this ISA report, Integrated Situational Awareness and Analysis Report today. This report developed into a complete migration and situational awareness report, which is really actively feeds into the work of the member state authorities every week. 
because there are at least 700 users who are downloading from this web platform uh, this report. This report was also one of the catalysator actually to, to, to start with a very complex um, information gathering process. And this, this, is, this is data which is shared on the basis of existing legal instruments uh, and shared with the Commission, with Frontex, and also with EASO, and they have their respective products where they, uh, they establish their databases on the basis of a common agreed um, terminology in principle. Um, and then we also have a qualitative reports which are coming from the field, which are coming from the, from the EU delegations, for example, and all of uh, the liaison officer uh, of, of Europe or the liaison officer of Frontex or the, or the Commission, also from third countries, um, and uh, which we also uh, base our analysis on, on open sources. So basically that is, that is the situational picture what we have now. And on that basis, we would move forward um, into the next stage, which, which would be this forecasting system. The, the absurdity of this, uh, the, the current situation now, that we are not in a crisis mode for quite some years, but this crisis system of the Council is still activated, and all of this information exchange also forms part of the crisis system. And the question is, and I think that is the political question also to the presidency, whether we can have the blueprint and the normal preparedness phase and forecasting phase of the blueprint when the information sharing formally still takes place in the, in, the, in the crisis system. So I think that is something to look at for the political decision makers, actually to move from the crisis mode to more uh, to the prevention mode. And the commission also uh, actually committed that we will provide all of this information and the report also after the crisis mechanism formally deactivated. So we will continue this way. Susanna, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. I think in the interest of time, we have to we have to wrap up. Okay, so just then extremely quickly. As I said, we have a lot of uh, traditional data sources and we also want to look, look up other data sources which are existing, uh, social media data, uh, geospatial data, and so on. And we commissioned a study um, to a consortium, which is called ACORIS, actually to, uh, to investigate how a forecasting and early warning system could work with our data, existing data sources and possibly new data sources with machine learning and artificial intelligence technology. So this uh, study is still going on. It will be delivered on the 18th of November. And um, that is a good progress. And actually, there are still a lot of questions to, uh, to, uh, to answer, basically. But this study will be the starting point to, to start actually the, feasib the actual feasibility discussions with all of the agencies, because we have to still carry on, as I said, with a multi-agency approach and also with the involvement of the member states, because they have to agree to these systems and they have to agree to the outcome of the system. So all of the techn technical part actually must be exactly uh, understood and agreed with all of our stakeholders. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Susanna, for this presentation. Um, uh, yeah, it seems like you're spearheading some really interesting uh, work there that will that will sort of push the envelope. But I can, um, <laughs> it sounds like you have quite a task in managing all the political interests of all the various institutions and agencies involved. So a big task there, and, and, and all the best of luck to that. There's some good news and some bad news. The good news is we still have almost 150 listeners um, that are tuned into the session. The bad news is very few of them are asking questions. So I want to remind all the participants um, to use the uh, possibility to put questions to any of the speakers. Uh, just write it into the chat function addressed to everyone. Um, and then we can put those questions to to the speakers. Don't be shy. I know we have, um, you know, uh, established uh, authorities, state authorities, uh, um, EU representatives, 
government representatives, but don't be shy. They're ready for your questions. So please go ahead and, and ask them. And don't, um, don't leave them all to me, which, of course, I benefit from that. But. Um, okay, uh, since there aren't any um, questions at the moment, I will park my own questions and then in the interest of time, move on to, uh, to Thomas Liebig and then uh, we'll ask some more questions to Susanne and the other speakers towards the end of the session. So um, with this, I would give the uh, floor to Thomas Liebig from the OECD. Um, over to you, Thomas. Thank you very much, uh, Jesper. It's a pleasure to share with you some of the results of uh, some work that we actually um, pursued as a background to our first ever OECD migration and integration ministerial um, earlier this year and in January, where we had actually the issue of, of, of foresight. And I'm, I'm trying to make the link between actually what, what we have heard throughout the day and with some of the policy um, migration management uh, um, implications that arise from that. So clearly we had a lot of discussions today on this issue of um, big data, forecasting and scenarios. Um, but clearly uh, where we put ourselves in the head of the policymakers, um, how do they feed that uncertainty and, and, and the knowledge that is created into their decisions? That is actually uh, a key question that we have perhaps addressed a little bit less, uh, less today. Um, but taking a step back, perhaps, before we, uh, we dig into that, I'd like to recall that actually the developments, the future developments that will largely impact on the way how we manage and perceive migration can actually be classified in three broad categories. Um, the first is megatrends, the second plausible disruptions, and the third unforeseen major uh, risk, uh, disruptions. Hopefully this will now get to the next slide. Um, when we talk about mega trends, um, I will just do this in any case. Uh, it will certainly in a minute uh, move on to the next slide. Uh, when we talk about mega trends, these are clearly um, relatively plausible, relatively foreseeable, but we don't really know yet. Oops, um, what is? Uh, I think my my uh, sharing has been interrupted. Um, can I please get again? Yes, thank you. Could you please try again, Thomas? Yes. Thank you. Let's go. But we don't really know how, when, and where they will impact on migration completely. I mean, demographic change in Africa, which countries in, uh, in, in Europe will be most affected? We don't really know. Environmental change, we know it's going to happen, but how exactly it will materialize in increased migration from which country to which country um, uh, is really unknown. Um, plausible disruption. Here we have much weaker science currently, particularly when we look at the impact that they will have on migration. They are largely unpredictable, but not completely unpredictable. And we know that they will increase in scale and scope, and they could potentially have a large impact on migration, but it's actually unclear when and how this will materialize. And a good example is the whole impact of technological change, which is actually also a mega trend, but how that is creating digital transparent migrants, how that will impact, for example, on border control, on migration management and enforcement. And then in the third category, clearly we have those unforeseen major disruptions where we have no or really weak signs currently, which are almost completely unpredictable, but will have a massive and sudden impact on migration. Clearly major conflicts arriving in key origin countries as part of those, as you all know, and probably would take the pandemic a year ago, uh, would have also been part of those unforeseen major disruptions when we look back. So how can policymakers prepare for these developments? And it depends, obviously, in part of the type of development what we're talking about. Preparing for megatrends means, first of all, to recognize the importance of these events for migration, to continuously monitor the situation and adapt policies. Here's something that we have perhaps less talked about and which I think is an under-researched area, is possible threshold effects and interactions. Uh, to give you one concrete example, 
um, uh, there's a lot of debate right now, how will COVID-19 and the uh, asymmetric impact that it's having across countries, for example, here in, in Europe, um, how will it impact on inter-European migration? Well, we know that a lot of countries like Spain and Italy, there wasn't much of an increase, uh, much less of an increase in migration as many feared um, uh, following the global financial crisis. But that's not all certain that we won't see a different pattern now because perhaps a lot of the people who, went, who, who stayed on through the first crisis, they say, well, this is the second crisis in 10 years, I'm leaving now. So these threshold effects are not really well researched. And then, obviously, we need to survey people in origin countries regarding their migration intent. That's all mega trends in the bigger picture. Preparing for plausible disruption. Here, clearly, the preparedness, in a way, means, first of all, to, to seize the opportunities that are there. So to seize the opportunities, notably of big data and then many other artificial intelligence, I mean, you name it, but avoid being ruled by that. I think that's very important that policymakers, that countries, maintain ownership and control over what's happening with those data. Um, clearly, it also means to continuously rethink existing processes and programs in light of these new developments. What opportunities and challenges do arise for my work uh, in this area uh, from these disruptions? And to also mainstream it in the administration. I'll get to that point uh, um, at the end again. And thirdly, to prepare for the unforeseen major disruptions. And here we have heard a lot of examples, and just now actually, um, to use intelligence and other, other depository tools to guard emerging signals, early warning systems. Um, and here, clearly, from a policy perspective, I think it's very important to avoid that we overly base our policy choices on short term developments to avoid the limit of overreaction. To give you one example, that could be a temptation right now to say, well, we could actually scale back the integration services for new arrivals because you have much less new arrivals right now. Um, but that would clearly be a mistake because uh, that situation may change relatively quickly. And once you have reduced your budget and you're planning for that, it's very difficult to adapt it in the future. Perhaps it's better an opportunity to reach out to some groups that you have previously not reached and to test new ideas and new tools because this is a good moment to test them. And last but not least, as was also mentioned, to build some contingency plans. There are some plans under the Chow for migration management and integration capacity in case of major disruption. In addition to all of that, to the specific category specific uh, preparations, clearly there's a need to improve the overall framework conditions for reaction. And we've actually heard from the examples from the European Commission and also from Germany. Um, that both at the national government level, um, there's a need for more policy coordination, but also more partnerships beyond the national government. So here to consider migration and integration as a cross-cutting issue uh, that connects with other policy domains like education, employment, social protection, trade development, and foreign policies. To, uh, to give you the example of, uh, of the uh, refugee crisis, um, it was interesting to observe that, um, that uh, as, you, as you know, uh, as many of you will know, uh, a lot of the, uh, of the push came actually from the decision of Iran uh, um, uh, and the policy decisions in Iran with respect to the Afghans living on the territory, uh, which, which pushed a lot of those out. Um, and, and actually, just prior to the crisis, European countries were negotiating the, um, uh, the agreement with Iran uh, on, on, on the foreign policy side. So, but the link wasn't done between the, between the migration side and the foreign policy side. And we see too, all too often the links also not there still, in spite, in spite of some improvement between trade and development policies and, um, and migration policy. So that clearly implies that these actors sit together and exchange information, not only in times of crisis. And I think it's very good, uh, as we have seen, just that, that these mechanisms that have been implemented at a crisis reaction that they continue to be in place um, uh, at the EU level and at some uh, national government. And clearly, this is not only a thing for the national government. This it requires new partnerships beyond the national uh, government to involve cities, social partners, uh, the civil society, perhaps also tech entrepreneurs who can alert policymakers about possible new tools that they could, that they could use. And clearly also migrants themselves, because these can be important information feeders. 
not only in the development of migration policies, but also in the foresight exercise that I think should be done much more systematic uh, uh, in, um, in, with respect to migration management. Clearly, we need to ensure that these partnerships don't favor some cities, some partners over others, uh, that they don't create new inequalities in terms of un, um, unfair competition or in-country inequalities um, with respect uh, to dealing with these. And clearly, the issue of partnerships with countries of origin, also that was mentioned several times. You not only think about, about central government partnerships, but also uh, with local communities. And using actually periods of relatively calm, uh, um, well, it's relatively calm on the migration side when that's going less in terms of uh, regular migration going on, um, to strengthen such partnerships. It's much more difficult to negotiate a return agreement when you have already lots of people have just arrived from that country. When you do it in a period where there's not been a lot of arrivals, it's much easier to do so. So to conclude, how can we ensure that policymakers take uncertainty into account? And actually, that link between all the nice tools that we've heard today and discussed and what actually policy action does with that, I think that is the most difficult link to achieve but it's clearly also the most important, because without that critical link, all the best instruments will be somewhat in vain. And from our perspective, I think there's three things that should be done. Uh, first of all, to mainstream foresight thinking throughout the whole of government, to involve both the leaders, the, the top leadership, but also the working level, that it's basically ingrained in your DNR of your organization to think about these kind of weak signals and how I can react to those. Policymakers also need to get gradual policy responses in accordance to the certainty. And I think COVID has been a good example of that. Um, in February, certainly uh, uh, this, um, uh, the situation was very different from March, April, and May and June. And the policy had to adapt to that uncertainty what happened uh, with the pandemic. And last but not least, even in periods where it's relatively calm, it's good to have sort of a crisis room in standby, to have all those kind of plans for what I would do if that major event would occur, to have it in standby. Because we know there's going to be a new crisis coming. We don't know how and where it will materialize. But given that uncertainty that we face and that we will continue to face and that is likely to increase, we need to maintain those standby crisis rules. So with that relatively short, uh, with a few short thoughts, I would um, like to conclude my presentation. So I invite you to have a look at our foresight publication. It's really downloadable and look forward to, uh, to the debate with you. Thank you. Thomas, thank you uh, so much for this presentation. Also, I much appreciate it for staying uh, within the time limit. You raised some really important and interesting points there. One very important point that resonated with me is the, the, the policy uptake of all these insights and all of these new models, right? If we, if we had the perfect forecasting system with all the relevant actors around the table, uh, how is this knowledge, how, these, how is this insight actually then used for facility, facility, uh, policy decision making? Uh, I think a, a fascinating question and, um, and something that could uh, be discussed much further, of course. Um, I think what I would like to do now is actually move on to the last speaker before we delve into the discussion, because some questions trickled in for Susana. So, Susana, you're not off the hook yet. And I'm sure during the next presentation, some questions will come in for Thomas as well. So um, I think what I would like to do is now move on to Alexander to our last speaker and then open the floor where I will raise um, several questions to, um, to all of the speakers that were implicated in some of the questions that came in. I hope that works for all of you. Um, thanks again, Thomas. And now over to Alexander for um, the last presentation of today uh, and the Data Refugee Council's project on uh, forecasting forced migration. Uh, Alexander, over to you. Thank you very much. I hope you can uh, see my screen. And, uh, and thank you very much for inviting me to, to present today. So I'll be presenting on the work we've been doing in the uh, Danish Refugee Council to explore the use of uh, predictive analytics 
uh, just give you a little bit of background for this work and then go into some details on the model we've been working on and then spend most of my time hopefully on some of the lessons we've learned. So our uh, work in this field was basically initiated about two and a half years ago where we entered into a partnership with uh, IBM with the funding from the Danish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And sort of the scope of the work was to explore the use of predictive analytics and its potential sort of value add in the humanitarian sector. We did this first by uh, trying to build a model to predict uh, mixed migration flows from Ethiopia and later shifted to focusing on predicting forced displacement. And when I talk about forced displacement, I'm talking about uh, refugees, asylum seekers, and uh, IDPs. As I mentioned, we, we w did this work together and in close partnership with IBM, and I think without their support, we probably wouldn't have uh, been here today. It was sort of a pro bono partnership where uh, IBM provided the IT infrastructure and the modeling expertise and uh, also sort of the expertise in building user experiences and, and online user platforms. Uh, what we brought to the table was, of course, a contextual understanding of what are the drivers of displacement, what are the indicators to look for, and the, the credible uh, data sources. So, as I said, we, we ended up building uh, or setting out to build this model on forecasting force displacement, seeing can we predict force displacement one to three years into the future. And we did this uh, around the developing a machine learning model uh, around a, a sort of framework of the known drivers of the displacement, including more than 120 different indicators in the model uh, and building it on open source data, uh, drawing a lot from the World Bank, different uh, UN agencies, as well as uh, NGO data. Um, and all the data we gathered was sort of on a, on a national level. And uh, as I mentioned, to see can we predict how many will be displaced uh, next year uh, in a given country. And we tested it out then in Afghanistan and Myanmar, and we got some very encouraging results. So the way we evaluated our model was to see, well, how well could the model predict sort of known outcomes? So how many forces be displaced? Would it predict that was in Afghanistan in 2010? And we could, of course, compare that to how many were actually displaced that year. And when we did that, we could see our model had an sort of average margin of error of around 8% in Afghanistan and around 10% in, in Myanmar, which is considered to be sort of quite, uh, quite accurate. We can also see from these results that there were some limitations to the model. And I think sort of two noticeable one is that it has a hard time predicting uh, sort of significant shifts or surges in displacement, such as the Rohingya crisis in, in the 2017 in Myanmar. And also that it works uh, better in context where, um, where you would say the displacement crisis is affecting a large part of the country and it works less well where displacement is more regionally confined because we're building the model around sort of national level data. Um, we also applied uh, the model to, to four Sahel countries. Um, and what we could see there, and in that context, we could compare our model to the current uh, planning figures being used in humanitarian response plans, which if you don't know them, are sort of the main strategic planning documents in, in the sector. And we, could, could, we can see that our model is actually slightly more accurate than the current uh, planning figures. And that sort of encourages us to see, okay, there is a potential added value here for the wider humanitarian sector and using this model or, you could say, uh, similar models. And to try to open up the black box a little bit uh, of uh, machine learning and letting our data scientists out, uh, unlike uh, ASO who, who want to lock them in, uh, we, we developed this online user interface where the users can go in and uh, see the forecast. They can access the underlying data, but maybe more importantly, they can go in and build their own scenarios and tweak the forecast based on their expertise and understanding of the situation. And this uh, platform will be made available to the wider humanitarian community because the vision isn't that this should be sort of a Danish Refugee Council tool, but that it should be used to inform the wider humanitarian uh, sector. 
before I go to the lessons learned, I just want to give a brief example of how we have used this uh, tool recently. Uh, so uh, we tried to see, okay, what, what is the impact of uh, COVID-19 uh, and analyze what impact uh, does it have on the sort of the drivers of a uh, forced displacement in a different context where we work. We then built uh, scenarios around this analysis to see how would it then impact on uh, forecasted displacement. Uh, and if we zoom in on the Sahel uh, countries, um, we can see that the baseline forecast in these four countries uh, predicted that around 1 million additional people would be displaced by the end of uh, 2021. With COVID-19 uh, impact taken into account, uh, that number actually increases to uh, 2 million people. Uh, so just an example of how we're currently using that for our strategic planning for, for the coming year. Uh, just quickly, then some of our lessons learned uh, venturing into this field, and I'll, I have sort of five points I want to make, and I'll try to be quick. One is, as I mentioned, there are these clear limitations in the model, especially the challenge of forecasting these lot, the certain large-scale displacements. So we don't see that these models will be used for sort of standalone tools for decision-making, but rather that it should be used in scenario building where the expert can sort of weigh in with the assessments of the context and the, and the model can sort of help translate that knowledge into more accurate figures. The other conclusion we have drawn is that when we've touched upon this, uh, also other speakers today about how does it inform action and policies for, for sort of to inform humanitarian action, what we see is that we need sort of clear policies for the applications of these models there needs to be also clear use cases in terms of who, when, and where are these models going to be used. Um, and also then we think it's important that you have this um, ability to enable at least non-technical staff to engage with the models for, for example, scenario building, to build their ownership and trust in, in the models, which we consider important to turn these models and forecasts into actions on the ground. In terms of then also communicating, we've also touched upon this today, um, about forecast results. I think for an NGO, it's, it's slightly difficult. Uh, we need to sort of strike that balance between raising alarm and using the forecast for advocacy and for increasing uh, funding and engagement of donors, while at the same time, of course, not sort of trying to raise too much alarm in terms of it leading to closure of borders or preventing opportunities uh, for seeking asylum. So just an example, when we sent out a press release two weeks ago, we had a small second last paragraph on this Sahel analysis of the impact of COVID-19. And obviously it was, uh, that was what made the, the headlines uh, rather than all the rest of the information in the, in the, in the press release. So I really think what we need to focus on when we talk about these results is that, yes, displacement trends are to some extent predictable. Um, so there really is an excuse for not being prepared. And the second point is that since they are predictable, then they are also to some extent preventable if you react early on. Um, and I think that is that is the point we should try to get across in, in some of this. The fourth point, uh, just briefly, is that I think we see in the humanitarian sector a little bit of sort of uh, uh, a, a focus, at least on a strong focus on the risk and ethical concerns around using these models. And that is very warranted, I would say. But we also have to make sure that it doesn't translate into disengagement, because I think there are already a number of ways that these new tools and technologies are being used to harm uh, the protection of our people of concern. So I think we also owe it to them to explore how can we use these technologies to enhance uh, protection outcomes. And the last point I want to make, and uh, and Thomas just mentioned sort of the, the digitally transparent migrants. Uh, I think what we are also seeing is that there are a lot of digitally invisible uh, people around the world. And I think we're seeing a little bit in the humanitarian sector, it's a little bit sort of a wild west, a gold rush, uh, and where of course the gold in, in these modern times is data. And there's a lot of focus on using uh, call detail records, social media, Google searches and so on. And for good reasons, and we've seen a lot of good examples of it today. But from a humanitarian organization, focusing on the most vulnerable groups in society. I think we're a little bit cautious about these new data sources, uh, especially because we see a significant portion of these populations being 
and sort of more data invisible. So just I put some data up here from 2019, around 87% uh, of Niger say they don't have access to internet on their phones and never use the internet, around 81% in Mali. And so you can see there are very high numbers here. So there is a risk that if we place too much emphasis on these new uh, data sources that we design models that uh, will be biased to more, more uh, affluent segments in these populations. And as you can also see in the in the data and the slide, the, the uses of internet depends a lot on your gender, education levels, and, and so on. At the same time, these models are being designed in headquarters in the West, far away from the affected communities. So I think really a role that we as an NGO needs to play uh, in this space is to ensure the participation of uh, communities in terms of both model development and inputs and, and playing the role in terms of making sure that they are visible in the modeling despite this uh, missing digital uh, footprint. I will stop there and uh, I'm uh, very pleased that I got this opportunity to speak with you today and look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Alexander. Very, very important points you raised from a from a different perspective, from a from a different actor. And I, I'm glad we have the Danish Refugee Council um, represented in this conference. Um, some important points that resonated with me uh, is that there are ethical considerations, of course, in any type of innovative approach when dealing with personal data of individuals, but also when uh, transferring so decision-making power to artificial intelligence and, and so forth. Um, there are there are ethical considerations um, at stake here that need to be considered. And the second point that I find uh, very important is that um, there are uh, approaches now that create new invisibilities, especially around some vulnerable populations that may not be um, uh, reflected in some of the approaches. And um, and that is an important point to raise. So thank you very much for that. We do um, have an, a, a particular question also for Alexander, but I want to open it up now to, to the whole panel. Because um, uh, now, um, thankfully, there are some questions from the floor that trickled in. So um, we have about 10 minutes, but uh, we might go a little over, over that because the questions are, are fascinating. So I, I uh, count on your patience. Um, First two questions uh, to Susanna. Um, one from Axel Kreinbrink, who is the uh, who works for the Federal Office for Migration and Refugees in Germany, the BAMF office, uh, and, and is a research head there, team lead for research. And he would like to know: um, Would it be the idea of the EU forecasting system to deliver data for the single member states, or only for different parts of our external borders as a whole? Um, and I'm going to combine this with another uh, sort of yeah narrow question also here from from uh, Teddy Wilkin from EASO who presented earlier. Uh, will the EU forecasting system take regular migration, for example, visa overstayers and, and, and visa free travel, uh, into account as well as irregular migration? Because you mentioned earlier, Susanna, that the system will focus on irregular migrants. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, so, so Teddy is asking whether that aspect of regular migration that will form part of overall migration will be uh, considered as well. So those two um, questions for you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think um, the first, of course, it's very important to look at the data sources. But before we are looking at the data sources, we have to determine the objective, what we want to, to forecast. And then we have to see whether we have sufficient uh, data sources for that. Our priority uh, lay in the moment uh, on irregular migration and Ill illegal uh, border crossings and uh, not on visa overstayers. And that is also my, my reply to the, to the um, question from the BAMF, uh, that first our intention is to start to focus on maybe on a small area and uh, which, is, which is well targeted and can be alienated from the rest. And then maybe gradually also to expand the system uh, for other aspects like overstayers, uh, secondary movements, and also for uh, asylum seekers who are coming from visa-free countries, so who don't need to illegally enter the EU. They can enter completely legally and then uh, they launch an asylum request. 
Um, I think whether a single member states can have that forecasting from this system, I think we have to discuss it when we, we will have all stakeholder consultation um, and what would be the requirement for that. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, um, Susanna. Um, there's another question for um, Alexander. So, was there mobile phone data used for the ex Afghanistan and Myanmar example? Um, that was one question. And then another question is, are there, um, will you test the model with additional countries? So, will you have uh, the continued IBM support? Maybe those, those analysts got tired of the corporate uh, job and moved over to you and are now happily analyzing humanitarian data all day. So, will we see additional case studies come out? And, and, and what is your view on scaling this model to additional cases? Yeah, uh, just uh, the the first question uh, on on mobile phone data. That's the very easy one. Uh, no, uh, we we didn't have any uh, mobile phone data in in the model, and and I don't think we foresee using that. One way we are foreseeing in in terms of expanding uh, the the data sources for the model is actually looking more in terms of uh, sub national data points where uh, where available in these in these countries and where where relevant. Uh, but that that's mainly where our Sort of expansion lies in terms of uh, expanding the model. Uh, yes, we are indeed. The, the aim is to um, to cover uh, uh, you could say the major uh, displacement producing context uh, and and add them uh, to to the online user interface within the next sort of three, four, five months. So hopefully we will within the next half year have cover sort of both. The, those displacement co contexts, but also uh, countries where we see a potential risk, where the model may be uh, may be able to, to to detect movement. So, so definitely that's ambition, and we can see that the model performs fairly well uh, when we add new countries. So, for the Sahel uh, countries, uh, you saw in the slides there was an average margin of error of around 16 percent, and that was uh, there was nothing done there in terms of trying to adapt the model to those specific contexts. So it is fairly easy to add new countries. Uh, it's more or less just changing a name and a code, uh, but then enhancing the models and, and improving them for the specific countries of course takes more time. Right. Um, thank you, Alexander. Um, a question for for Thomas as well. You mentioned the importance of involving a, a multitude of actors around the table. You mentioned, for example, cities, tech companies. How do you best do this? How do you uh, best involve all these multiple actors in decision-making process? How do you feed that insight into a policy process? And because, uh, you know, linked with another argument that was mentioned earlier, of course there are intelligence uh, agencies involved in this. There's uh, satellite data being used at times, right? There's personal call data sometimes used. So sometimes sensitive information that is not necessarily made public but um, uh, for to incorporate additional actors, right? You, you would need some some more transparency also about the different approaches. So I was just curious on your views on how do you get all these actors around the table and let them feed into uh, into the process and whether yeah you can, you have good experiences with, with doing that maybe from other fields as well. Yeah, thanks, Jasper. Um, I, I think we need to. We need to move away from the big data perspective to uh, to, to two issues here. Uh, the first is in when we when we do, for example, a foresight exercise, and, and as I said, I think it would be very useful to do that on a regular basis. Clearly, when you do those kind of workshops, it can be very fruitful to have those external stakeholders on board because they bring additional views. It's precisely this kind of diversity type of argument. Uh, um, um, that you can apply here very well and which works very well with respect to the out-of-the-box thinking that you want to achieve in the type of forecasting. This is not for sharing the most confidential information. This is for thinking out of the box uh, and identifying weak signals. And I think there, in those kind of workshops that can be organized, there it, uh, it can be very, uh, very valuable. So that's once on the, on the let's say, forecasting side or uh, um, foresight uh, side more, 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 more specifically. Um, when you look in terms of migration policy making, uh, clearly quite a few countries have some kind of advisory boards 
um, uh, but these are often have a very limited role. Um, uh, sometimes there's, there's experts, for example, in, in the UK, the Migration Advisory Council is just actually in charge of determining the, the short of occupation shortage list for labor migration. So they really cover only a tiny bit of the market. But in principle, obviously, and, and it's, it's mainly experts, it's labor market economists, and that's not the type of diversity what I was talking about. But I think you could, uh, but you have that very well established when you talk uh, about the integration field, that's, that's very common to have some kind of integration councils which, which advise the government on the different on the different aspect. And I think nothing would prevent government from trying it out with respect to migration management as well. Uh, that once again, these advisory councils, you don't have to take their decision into account, and you have your own intelligence that is apart from that from those views. But taking that into account can actually be, I think, very, very fruitful, once again, to get that holistic, uh, holistic uh, perspective. Uh, thank you, Thomas, for this, this perspective. Um, one last small comment for Alexander, and then I wanted to close with more of a bigger picture question to all of you. We do a little, do, do a little round to, to close this off. Uh, but first, a small question to Alexander. Uh, can you distinguish between internal and external displacement in your model? Uh, no, we cannot. It was part of um, it was part of the development exercise, and to, to make it a little bit uh, less sensitive, uh, we decided to not distinguish between IDPs and uh, refugees and asylum seekers. Uh, so, so we we're not in that sense predicting where people would go or sort of the direction of the flow and whether they will stay or not. Uh, yeah. Right. Thank you, Alexander. Okay, so to wrap this up, the session, the last session of today, uh, one bigger picture question uh, from for me to to all of you, and I would I would ask you to sort of respond briefly to it, but uh, yeah, give me your quick reaction um, to the following questions. Let's imagine uh, the EU now is coming up with a comprehensive system. There's there are massive resources also invested in research at this stage. Let's imagine ten years down the road we have an EU EU forecasting system. What and you are in, you are in charge uh, in ten years and you are the uh, the commissioner or um, yeah you're the relevant commissioner or the uh, council president or somebody in charge and you have to decide whether this funding for the system will be uh, continued or not. How accurate does the system have to be uh, for you to to do the thumbs up rather than the thumbs down? Is one feeling that I have in all this discussion is. How do we actually will, how will we evaluate the success of such a system? What do we want out of it for for this momentum in this field to be continued? So uh, a quick quick reaction from from all of the speakers uh, on on what would you expect ten years down the road to get out of this, and and what do you think uh, when do you think it will be worthwhile to have invested uh, this effort in this field? Um, maybe let's start with. Um, uh, with Susanna, and then we move to Tobias, and then to uh, Alexander and Thomas. That order was completely random. Um, there was no no thought behind that. So uh, Susanna, um, over Thank to you. you very much. Uh, I will give you an extremely uh, bureaucratic reply, like a good EU official. Please so, do. <laughs> <laughs> probably the if. Such system is uh, is established because it will require a lot of financial resources, and of course, maybe the reshuffling of the competences of the agencies or to establish really a formal cooperation. So we will have a legal basis for this, and in the legal basis will contain a review clause. So all of the in every two or three years, basically the efficiency of the system and the delivery of the system must be reviewed. And I think uh, afterwards the necessary adjustment must be made. Uh, these kind of IT systems, um, they are always subject of continuous testing, basically. So it's not that they are developed, launched, and then they, they are just working. Because especially if they are working with data models and, and machine learning, these models always have to be retrained. Uh, the results always have to be checked. So there is a continuous validation process and a continuous uh, testing and adjustment process. And in addition to, to this, which is always subject to a stakeholder consultation, I'm sure that there will be a technical committee uh, with all of the member states experts in this. And um, 
and these changes will be subject to, to their approval. Basically, and in addition to that, there will be this formal evaluation of the systems in every two or three years, so, so periodically. I'm, I would be very happy if in 10 years' time we would have really <laughs> a functionable system which can be already by that time really evaluated, but I think it's, it's very realistic, in fact, uh, that, 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 can be, that can be done. And I hope that it will um, really work according to the accuracy of the member state expert and uh, we have set it and, and the experts, so how it is, uh, how it is agreed. And uh, we have to see whether it really contributes to the decision making process in some way. Um, um, I think if, if something like that is established, it is not abolished because it never happens. So we will never say that no, it's five years ago and this, this system, we demolish it and it doesn't have to work. But then the necessary adjustments uh, uh, will be, the necessary adjustments will be made. Um, well, I just uh, I just hope that it will work according to expectation, and then it will be able to also to be expand so from a relatively small scope to 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 work on a on a larger scope, and uh, just for a relatively short uh, uh, prediction or or early warning, it would be able to to deliver a, a longer term also a longer term uh, forecasting up to two years, and. Um, well, and then afterwards, we have to see how it is the adjust, uh, adjustment, but I think once it is established, it will be continuously improved, but it won't be turned off. Thank you. That is my experience. <laughs> thank, you, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to thank do you. some uh, individual forecasting for this forecasting uh, system. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and the next uh, uh, forecaster is uh, Tobias Molanda. Tobias, what do you think? Thank you very much. Um, well, I can, I can give a very brief answer. The, the, definite, the system will definitely be around or some kind of system and it will not be turned off because there's basically no alternative. As I tried to highlight in my presentation, any policy that we undertake in the future should be based on data, on intelligence, on analysis. This can be done either manually or with technological means and will most likely be a mix. So uh, the question I think in 10 years is not if we turn that system off or not, but how much more we can invest to improve it even further. But as I said, like um, there's basically no alternative to uh, an information driven approach that helps us better understand the challenges and uh, the problems at hand. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think the next one in line was Alexander, wasn't it? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, oh, sorry, I kept on muting myself and unmuting. I'll I'll try to give you the NGO answer. Then now that we got the bureaucratic answer, uh, <laughs> I would say uh, I would say if we have a model and models that are being used to protect uh, people rather than borders, then I think we should continue and heavily invest in that. And then I think in terms of sort of the the accuracy, I would say for for, for, for models for forecast, for force displacement, I hope we are in a position ten years from now that we have forecast models that constantly fail because we are able to see the predictions and act accordingly and thereby prevent a force displacement from occurring in the in the first place. So I hope we see a lot of the failure of these models ten years from now. No, I, 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 that was too clever. I didn't expect that. I didn't expect that answer. That's a, that's a good one. Um, Thomas, you, you're the lucky last. You had all this time to prepare a good answer for this for this question. So let, let's hear it. <laughs> yes, thank you. So I'll try to to add on to what has been said. First of all, mm -hmm. I think this is a public good. So there's a clear use of EU action in this. So that's already the principal check boxes is marked. Um, I don't think the accuracy of the system should be the most important one. I think that's actually perhaps the least important point in the whole system. <laughs> um, I think it would be much more important that it has a good early warning sense for really major things happening, which is not the same as being an accurate tool. Um, I would look also, particularly in case of emergency, how does it adapt to an emergency situation? I mean, like, what's, what's it using in case of emergency? So when from year to year business, if it doesn't really 
if it has some failures, it's less important. But if it it ha must be important in terms of must show its value added in terms of emergency. Um, Three, when you make the decision, you should also look look at what's the marginal cost of continuing uh, because building up something new is very expensive, but running it is less expensive. And then last but not least, I think, uh, as I said, it's not only in terms of data accuracy, that's actually not the, not the key point, but will it bring together different viewpoints, data sources, um, perspectives that can be used in terms of major disruptions, because that's where the use is going to be. And how is it going to be used then by policymakers? I think that's, that's the ultimate question. If you have a perfect system, but nobody uses it, then, uh, then it's perhaps not useful to continue that. But if it trickles down in the decision process and it's actually used on the day-to-day -day work of those decision makers, then certainly it should be continued. Thank you very much, Thomas. Very, very clear points, very concise. Um, we will send that recording to the to the EU Commission and decision makers in Brussels, and in ten years down the road, you can dig it up and see uh, see if we made it. Uh, I want to say a big thanks to all the new speakers for for presenting such interesting uh, presentations today. Um, I want to say a big thanks to the European Migration Network and to the IOM Austria colleagues who've been organizing this, uh, this fantastic conference. A big thanks to um, um, Austrian government for supporting this effort. For me personally, it was a, a very exciting and a lot of fun to, to be able to chair some of the sessions today and to listen to all of the interventions. Uh, and with this, I will hand over to Julia uh, in, in Vienna, over to Vienna uh, for, for some closing remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Jasper. Um, I don't have uh, much to say. Except for thank you, Jasper, for co-moderating um, this day with me. I really, really enjoy that. I think uh, you really triggered some very interesting conversations. And um, I would like to also thank all our speakers once more. It was uh, really fantastic. I want to thank them not only for their contributions today, but also for agreeing to contribute to an outcome document of this conference, which is the special issue of the bi-monthly journal Migration Policy Practice. So please keep a lookout for this forthcoming issue, which will summarize all the conversations we've had today. And. Um, also, very importantly, if not most importantly, thank you so much to my team here in Austria. You were absolutely fantastic. I'm very sorry that you didn't get to meet them. And first and foremost, Lukas Hummer, who's been really uh, the backbone of organizing this event. If you, uh, I'm sure you've all individually been in touch with him. He did a fantastic, outstanding job. Uh, we had no technological issues today, which I think is a miracle, but actually it is uh, thanks and due to his uh, his hard work and his rigor. Thank you also to, I will now mention my, my team, it is very small, but I really uh, think it is worth it, to Priska Ebner, to Alexander Spiegelfeld, to Martin Stiller, uh, to Katrin Fink, and to Stefan for their fantastic support. Thank you so much. Um, and finally, thank you to all the participants who are still online, which I think is amazing. It's been an outstanding debate and, debate and discussion with fantastic questions and inputs from you. Uh, so have a lovely rest of your evening and please do stay in touch. Thank you.